<laughs> All right, uh, welcome everybody um, to the virtual, second virtual seminar of the semester in collaboration with the University of Ottawa and the Université de Montréal. Um, I want to begin by acknowledging that the University of Guelph resides in the ancestral and treaty lands of several indigenous peoples, including the Atawandaran people and the Mississauga of the Credit, and that we recognize and honor our Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and Métis neighbors. The Dish with One Spoon Covenant speaks to our collective responsibility to steward and sustain the land and environment in which we live and work so that all peoples, present and future, may benefit from the sustenance it provides. Also, I want to acknowledge that land acknowledgements are not enough and that we acknowledge the history of violence and dispossession that underlie the current, uh, that underlies the current protests and solidarity actions in support of the Wet'suwet'en First Nation who are fighting against government and corporate interests to protect their sovereignty. So with that, I'll hand it over to Kim. Thank you. Okay, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce Aaron Lindo, uh, who's a professor of history at the University of Wisconsin at La Crosse, with specializations in public and digital history. Her work focuses on the cultural history of dress, fashion, and gender. Not what we're going to hear about today. <laughs> And she has a 2013 book with Bird Publications entitled Victorian Fashion Accessories. And more recently, on place based histories of underrepresented peoples. This includes peer reviewed scholarship in journals such as The Public Historian and Curator, the Museum Journal, as well as exhibits and community installations. Projects such as Here Here and Sun Up in a Sundown Town highlight marginalized voices, disrupting widely accepted narratives of whiteness and prosperity in American and Canadian communities. She is currently working on a monograph, Comfortable Lies, Uncomfortable Truths, Public History, Private Memory, and Race in 21st Century North America, which is based on her Here Here Oral History Project. Please welcome her. And are we recording? Yes, we're recording. All right. Thank you so much. Before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge that La Crosse was built on the ancestral land of the Ho Chunk people. I'm also, just so you know, donating proceeds of this talk to. Um, a fund to take down the statue of Hiawatha that I'll be talking about today. In 2015, a member of the Ho-Chunk Nation recorded the following oral history while standing at the foot of a two-story statue portraying an Indigenous person. On the screen. <laughs> On the screen. Okay. We're in the north end of Riverside Park. I just turned my back symbolically on what the UWL Native American students used to refer to as the Colossus of Kitsch, or as Riverside Park calls the Big Indian. First, my name is Ketacho Maniga. That means the person who paints the sky blue. You know me as Dan Green what Malcolm X might have called my slave name. At the time, the late 90s, the Chamber of Commerce in La Crosse proposed $50,000 into a paint job on the Colossus, something that reinforces stereotypes about Native Americans. As a sociology student, I had for years looked into the influence of imagery, statuaries, and I was a part of the National Anti-Native American Sport mascot movement. Movement. I traveled to uh, University of Illinois, University of North Dakota, and Cleveland, Ohio on a regular basis to demonstrate and to teach about the harms, the largely psychological harms of this kind of imagery of the big Indian standing behind me. So that was my interest, that here it is in my hometown where I'm raising children that look like me. They're brown-skinned, they're dark-haired. We don't get mistaken for anything but Native American. And here's something in our hometown reinforcing harmful thinking about us. So I was compelled to do something. This oral history is one of the first recordings done for a critical public history project that's called Here Here. Here Here seeks to bring previously overlooked or unheard stories to light as a way of enhancing traditional narratives of the region that highlight Christianity, prosperity, and whiteness, and ignore indigeneity, race, and cultural difference. Launched in 2015 with 28 stories, Here Here is an oral history project brought to life through signs in downtown La Crosse, Wisconsin. This is the way that it works. You're seeing it here. Uh, signs are placed where stories are told. Uh, they have 1-800 numbers on them and a story and an area a story and the location call, call, code, 
you call that number and you hear a story of the exact space in which you stand. If you stay on the line, you can leave a message about that space or any other space in the downtown area. And if it fits our objectives, we add that to the, to the project. And in that way, it becomes user generated. The only requisite for a hear, hear story is that it be told by the person who experienced it. Because of this user generated project from 28 stories in 2015, today in 2020, we have 70 stories. Between its inception in 2014 and the most recent edition of stories in 2019, the meaning of Here Here shifted from being a way to bring social history uh, to the public to a project that could act as a catalyst for restorative justice. We found that stories that were coming out uh, helped to prompt community discussions about lacrosse and the downtown and how it might improve. Based on stories told by historically underrepresented and marginalized people, we came to understand that Here Here's mission was not only to represent unknown stories, but also to foster conversations that might lead to positive change. The questions at stake are these. Why do people experience the same spaces differently? And why does this difference matter? And then secondly, how can a community come to hear, understand, and incorporate diverse voices when these voices challenge the accepted wisdom? I'll start with the discussion of how Here Here is digitally is a digital humanities project, and then I'll discuss the long history of this controversial statue um, and how Here Here narratives became part of, of the catalyst for taking it down. This talk is based on a chapter that will appear in an edited volume that will be published by the University of Cincinnati Press in 2020. Not 2000, that would have been 20 years ago now. <laughs> um, and it will form part of the chapter of the book that was already mentioned, Comfortable Lies, Uncomfortable Truths. Okay, let's talk about the digital backup of this project. There are various ways in which Here Here is a digital project. It was developed and is stored almost entirely on Google Docs. The narratives are recorded digitally and then they're edited with audacity. And the unedited versions of the interviews are available on a digital repository as well as the edited versions. Some versions of the project are also supplemented by an app uh, that we've joined in with called Driftscape. There's a website as part of this project and there's a phone system that backs it up digitally. I'm gonna take this opportunity to talk about the phone system as that is the most innovative digital aspect of this project. The phone system is an interactive voice response system or IVR system that's called Easy Route and it's hosted by CenturyLink, which is a US and sometimes Canadian uh, phone system or phone company. IVR systems uh, use, are used in large companies to direct calls and provide recorded information to people who call in. Here, here is backed up by a, this business solution, but it is, it in, is employed in a more user-friendly way. The purpose of the project is to help users listen to stories while normal IVR systems are used to triage callers and restrict their access to an increasing, min, increasingly minimized number of human agents. So we've used a system that's designed to eliminate human voices uh, to instead amplify and expose more voices uh, from more types of people. The way that Easy Route uh, functions is via a phone tree, and here's an image of our phone tree. Um, Here Here's phone tree is based on uh, the initial toll-free number that people call in and then a location number and a story number. So there's nine digits on your keypad, on your telephone keypad. So it's a nine by nine system with the possibility uh, of 81 different locations. Each location can then have another story, in fact, seven more stories at them. And then we, we triage that or we, we use that in the same way as a business would where on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, you might hear a certain story, and then on the other days, you might hear a different story, or a different story out of the, every day of the seven days of the week. Uh, just like in a business solution, on the weekends or in the evenings, you would hear, please call back later. <laughs> in our case, you always hear the stories uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 or 66 in this, in this year, uh, days out of the year. The IVR technology also provides another benefit. We're able to track the days and the times of the calls, the volumes of the calls per month, the area codes that we get each call from, 
and uh, the length of the calls. So this has been beneficial in that it, it has let us really understand the project in new ways. Some of the things that we've, we've learned are these. So here's, here's our data generated into an image. Um, but we had two major launches of new stories in this project. Can you guess when they were? <laughs> We were in April. <laughs> they were in April uh, 2015 when we first launched, and then another one in 2018. So you can see the blue and the, the yellow lines here that indicate that. Um, and what's interesting about this is that is that April becomes obviously you start using people start using the phone system in April, but we see a bunch of months where they use it much less. And those months are predictably in Wisconsin, January, February, March, <laughs> November, and December, right? So we can see the use of, of the phone system changes depending on the, the weather outside. Today's weather might generate a, a little bit less calling in. The other thing that's really interesting, I think, about this data is that not only do we have more calls that come in uh, on the, uh, when, we, when we do special events like launches, in 2018 and 2015 in the first slide, but also in the second and third in May and June, you can see that in the months following for those two years, you also have more calls. So it's very clear that it's important to remind people that this is a user-generated project and that there's more stories that come out all the, all of the time. The other thing that we track is um, the area codes that call in. Uh, and as of uh, August 2019, we got every single state in the United States uh, called into the project. So we're very proud of this <laughs> because uh, the town of La Crosse is only 50,000 people. And it is not a tourist destination, <laughs> uh, but apparently it is. <laughs> so also um, two provinces in Canada have called into this particular system, neither of which I'm from, uh, Quebec and, and also BC, and then Puerto Rico and the, dis and the District of Columbia as well. Um, we've had over 10,000 calls since we began, 50% uh, are local, 48%, I know that doesn't add up, but 48% are non-local, the other 2% we aren't able to track because it's blocked. It's interesting to note as well that the first two years had mainly local calls, and then after that uh, we started to get more non-local calls. So we're seeing how it's transitioning into a tourist, tourist draw, because it's unique to London, Ontario, and La Crosse, Wisconsin. Um, and partly, we, could, we are seeing this shift likely because uh, we started to um, become a member of Explore La Crosse, which is the local bitters, visitors bureau. Okay, so they are now distributing uh, our pamphlets and putting more information out about us. So that's, I think, why we're seeing that transition. The other thing that we that we know from the data is that the average call time or length of call that people stay on the line is one minute and forty seven seconds. So that first story that you heard by Kara Chomaniga was actually originally six minutes long, right? It's a very important story. So it was six minutes long, and uh, we found out people aren't listening for six minutes. So, so because of this data, as we, as we have increased the number of stories, we've made sure that, that the, that the um, length of the stories are two minutes or less. Now there's some lessons learned I'd like to tell you about now. Easy, the easy route system is not without its problems, but it is easy to program, as you saw, very simple phone tree. It fit our budget and it provided the lowest barrier to access. Some issues with easy route include that it takes a, it takes a very poor type of audio file called box files. Hopefully you've never even heard of that <laughs> because it's very poor. It also um, will only allow 180 second um, sound sound bites and we found a way around that. It's also a lesser known product of a very large company so it took us a really long time to to get with the right people so that they could provide it for us. When we began the project in 2014-2015 we found that EasyRoute was the most affordable version of an uh, IVR system. We looked at um, developing our own IVR system but that would cost about 12 times the amount that EasyRoute would so nope let's not do that. Um, uh, but since then, with uh, cloud technology that's come out, and with the problem that EasyRoute says, uh, CenturyLink tells us that EasyRoute is only in America, despite it also being a Canadian company, um, we have had to find new solutions. So for the London, Ontario project, we have used um, 
we, for the London Ontario project, we have used Amazon Web Service or AWS's Connect product. Um, and this, this is, there's a lot of benefits to Connect. It's much, much less expensive. Um, uh, it uses wave files of any length. Okay, and it can also drill down into data much more. Right? Of course, it's Amazon. Of course, it can drill down into data much more. So this is the initial flow. Uh, of AWS, it's not a tree, it's a flow, right? You can already see there there's differences. And then each one of these nodes has a whole bunch more in it, okay? So there's the start one, <clears throat> here's the welcome flow. Gets kind of complicated, right? Uh, here's the read story flow. Here's the read, the read story again, because there's more than one story at, at each location or at many of the locations in the London project. Here's the voicemail flow, right? So much more complicated system um, uh, but there's, there's some huge benefits. And also for all of you all over Canada, I'm very, very willing to share. Uh, so if you'd like to create a, a Here Here project in a town near you, <laughs> or your very own town, uh, call me, we'll, we'll uh, do it together. Um, so now that you understand how the project works in terms of digital technology, I'll spend the remainder of the talk um, a bit, uh, talking about here, here, and how um, it it worked in order to change policy around this uh, large statue. Oops. Okay. Answering machine flow. We missed that <laughs> apparently. Okay. So here we go. Storytelling as an element of local uh, policy change. Three stories emerged in the first three years of uh, the Here Here project. They acted as a catalyst for the retirement of a gigantic statue that's along the Mississippi River in La Crosse, Wisconsin. The first narrator was, the, was Kara Chomaniga, who you heard at the outset of this, of this presentation. The second phase in 2017 included a poetry contest. In this poetry contest, we got a story or a poem that talks about the image of Hiawatha, which we're seeing at the end there, as cartoonish. Right? And you can see the specific cartoons that they're drawing upon, it's always Disney. The third uh, story that came out the following year in 2018 is told by a Lutheran pastor who talks about the statue as representative of the protest that he was involved in against the North Dakota Access Pipeline. Of course, relating a little bit to what happens in Canada as well. By no means is here here the first to air lacrosse citizens opinions about this statue. In fact, the Hiawasa statue um, has been embroiled in controversy for over 60 years. There have been three major periods where the arguments surrounding the statue came um, more intense or yeah, became more intense and here we've got them here. So the first one was when it was first conceived, created and named. The second was when it, it was in need of costly repair. And the third and most recent version, which Here Here was involved in, and other organizations as well, it was about how we all came together to create pressure to create change in local policy. So let's start with the first. In the initial period of controversy, arguments around the statue centered around two things, naming and placement. The Chamber of Commerce wanted to name the statue Hiawatha, who, as you probably know, is a Haudenosaunee um, chief. They were basing this idea of naming it Hiawatha over this little character here, who's also called Hiawatha, a Disney character. But it's made famous by a poem that's written by Longfellow, yeah. So that's what they wanted to base it upon. Um, the the La Crosse County uh, Historical Society, on the other hand, wanted greater accuracy by naming the statue Chief Decora. Which is, a, which is somebody from the local Ho-Chunk tribe. Now, what happened in the end because of this long debate is a couple of things. First of all, the Chamber of Commerce retained the name. So they, they called it um, Hiawatha. And the, the, um, the Cross County Historical Society was able to put up a plaque uh, that was about the history of the Ho-Chunk, then called the Winnebago. But that's been stolen and nobody knows where it is. Now, because this naming debate lasted over three years, um, the, the, the local people started to call this statue what Karachal Maniga said at the beginning, the Big Indian, right? So that begins in the press in, in 1963, and it is certainly what they still call this statue in La Crosse today. 
That's the common referral of, of the name of the statue. The second issue that came up in this uh, initial period was one of placement. Alvin Blackdeer, who was the commander of the Winnebago now Ho-Chunk Indian Veterans Association, made an impassioned argument against putting the statue named Hiawatha at the convergence of three rivers, which is where it is, um, as it uh, was considered by the Ho-Chunk to be sacred ground. I'll just let that land. <laughs> Black Deer explained, and I'm quoting here, Hiawatha had no connection with the state of Wisconsin. You can appreciate perhaps why we feel that the worship of false idols should be eliminated from this sacred area. All things considered, including the loss of our lands, should we not at least be allowed to save our historical birthright for posterity?" End quote. At issue for Black Deer was that the statue had the potential to erase from public memory the violence that marked the encounters between indigenous people and the settler colonialists from Europe. And the site of this statue is particularly meaningful in the larger history of the US government control and removal of indigenous peoples. The Mississippi River on which the statue stands was once separated Michigan territory from what they call Indian territory. All tribes living east of the Mississippi were removed to Indian territory as sanctioned by the Indian Removal Act of 1830. Federal, federally sanctioned Ho-Chunk removal by steamboat from La Crosse on the Mississippi River occurred between June and November, 1848. The location of the statue is not only sacred ground for the Ho-Chunk, it is also a site that holds the history of violence, removal, and cultural genocide perpetuated upon the Ho-Chunk by the U.S. government on behalf of the settlers who came to live in La Crosse, Wisconsin. Just going to take a sip here of my water. So now moving to the second uh, debate the second moment when, when uh, the statue came into question. In the year 2000, the statue again came into the news because it was physically deteriorating. In fact, it was falling apart and became dangerous for people to walk around it. The city was again, um, uh, kind of take, took notice of it. They started to debate uh, whether or not they should get the statue down or should they repair it. If they were to repair it, it would cost $35,000. The decision to remove, alter, or retire the statue would be up to a nine-member committee, and the committee was called the Committee to Consider the Future of the Statue Hiawatha. Three of the committee members identified as Ho-Chunk. A new set of arguments around the statue um, come up, and these sets of arguments are all around the question of honoring. Who is being honored? how to properly honor, and whether or not one culture has the right to choose how another is honored. The pro-statue argument centered around protecting the legacy of the deceased art teacher who created it. His name is Anthony Zanderhockel, with his son and his wife explaining that the statue meant a lot to their relation and lamenting that it might be taken down. The family also posthumously attributed their father with the intention to honor the whole chunk people, the Ho-Chunk people, remember Hiawatha is not Ho-Chunk, um, and the, sum, the son uh, of the family uh, summarizes this, these views thus. The statue shows nothing but pride and strength, and anyone who feels that the Big Indian is offensive is a, uh, and is a stereotype is either ashamed of their ancestors and their past or totally unaware of the true image of their roots. Dale Littlejohn, an elder of the Ho-Chunk Nation, challenged the artist's intentions and spoke uh, to the issue of who has the right to honor the Ho-Chunk people. Here's a quote from Dale Littlejohn. You do not honor a people by building a statue that hopefully will bring in tourist dollars as stated by your family ancestor. Maybe it would be appropriate for the Ho-Chunk Nation to dig up your ancestors and see if they have forked tongues and sell replicas of these tongues to raise tourist dollars for the Ho-Chunk Nation. Think of these endeavors very seriously because we are only trying to honor 
your people. Now, the second response to the question of honoring was put forward by Hear, Hear narrator Kara Chalmaniga, um, who was heavily involved in this debate in the, in the year 2000. Here's a quote from him. Here is this maybe well-intentioned statue. But what we, are, what we have to remember is that intentions do not determine consequences. Maybe these things were supposed to be honoring of Native Americans, and we appreciate the intention, but do we appreciate that maybe that's not what they resulted in? Maybe a mistake was made. Well intentioned, but a mistake was made. The nature of the mistake was articulated by a University of Wisconsin uh, La Crosse student at the time who changed the narrative from one that was focused around honoring to one that's more familiar to Canadians focused around trauma. In Matt Stewart's words, the statue symbolizes the mass genocide of our people. We get offended to see reminders. Remember this person's name, Matt Stewart. One big difference between the 1990s, 1960s debate and the 2000s debate was that the Ho-Chunk were invited to speak. But in, in order to have them heard, uh, they had to engage in debates about honoring that were set out by the family of the artists and their supporters. Those who tried to forge new narratives about genocide and trauma were uh, not given much space in the narrative. And in the end, the Ho-Chunk were listened to, but they were not heard. The final vote that came from the committee to consider the future of the statue Hiawatha ended in a vote of five to four in favor of refurbishing the statue and keeping it up. The deciding vote was uh, given by the homeschool coordinator for the Ho-Chunk Nation, a Ho-Chunk person himself, who said that he consulted with Ho-Chunk elders who did not find the statue offensive. An interesting fact that we can take up later if you'd like. As evidenced by the final decision, it was those who remembered the artist and those who who were able to define uh, the statue and how it honored. And for them, it honored both the man who had created it and the Ho-Chunk, the Ho-Chunk, not Hiawatha, <laughs> that it was claimed to represent. Now, the reason why white Americans are able to make this argument so successfully is because of the presumed innocence of American culture bolstered by concepts of manifest destiny and American exceptionalism. These concepts disavow the nation's imperialist endeavors, such as the conquering of land once belonging to indigenous groups, and end up as an underlying presumption of in innocence, not only of the nation, but also of the individuals who uphold these concepts. The family and friends of Zimmerhockel feel that they, were, that they were attacked by the other side, who considered Anthony to have engaged in cultural appropriation. Here's a quote from the other side of things. I object that those of us who like the statue are attributed with motives who that are not true. Now there's coded language in here. Really, they're saying, I object to being called racist. One supporter says, right? There is a presumed innocence in this mindset and an arrogance that there is only one way of viewing the past and the present. The presumed innocence is not only on the individual level, as I'm trying to show you here, but also on a national level. Statue supporters are, are able to, to um, assert that they're, they're innocent in portraying the Ho-Chunk people as big Indian uh, because their entire culture is innocent. They have effectively rewritten history and forgotten the reality of their position as a conquering and a warring force. And it is from this position that they, that they can claim to honor the pride and strength of those who were forcibly removed from the hallowed grounds of the La Crosse County area. And it is with great irony that it is a family member who can claim that the Ho-Chunk, rather than the white man, is either ashamed of their ancestors and their past, or are totally unaware of the true image of their roots. <coughs> Okay, so now we'll move on to the third debate. This time, here, here was involved. So from 2015, from 2015 through 2018, the statue again became part of a fierce debate. 
In 2015, the Hear Hear Project launched Kiara Chomaniga's uh, narration. Later in 2015, there was a 24 minute student created video about the statue that was shared widely. In 2016 and 2018, two more Hear Hear stories came out about the statue that I described earlier. In 2017, because of the national controversy around Confederate monuments, the Arts Board at the City of La Crosse and the Human Rights Commission at the City of La Crosse came together to have a debate about the statue. It was really about statues in general, but of course it became about uh, the Ho-Chunk statue um, or the, the Hiawatha statue. Um, and that debate happened on, uh, on, uh, at the Ho-Chunk Three Rivers house, okay? an important detail. Later in March, a petition for a statue's removal and a letter writing campaign began. So, you, so I haven't mentioned everything, but here's a list of all the things that happened um, as, a, as a timeline uh, around, around from 2015 until 2018. On the anti-statue slide, the arguments uh, presented in this period were getting more sophisticated. They talked about uh, stereotypical imagery how the internalization of this stereotypical imagery uh, leads to suicide. And there is a lot of um, feeling in this argument because that person, Matt Stewart, Stewart, that I showed you earlier, suicided about four years ago. So there's a direct connection when this argument is being made from the hearts of the people who are making them. Then there's the question of homogenizing indigenous people. So, in this argument, they say, don't assume that Hiawatha, a Haudenosaunee chief from the area around New York, uh, can represent uh, the Ho-Chunk from Wisconsin. Thirdly, historicizing images of indigenous people is problematic because it forgets that indigenous people uh, still exist today. Um, especially, it especially makes us forget that it, they exist today in urban environments. And then these three things, stereotyping, homogenizing, and historicizing, all are forms of white supremacy used to help to maintain a white is white right history that keeps indigenous people and their history down. So the arguments in the space for keeping the statue relied on arguments from the 2000 debate uh, that were around it just being a tradition in the city, honoring of the Ho-Chunk people and nostalgic memories of the artist. But two new arguments emerged in this camp. Uh, and they are that um, the Zimmerhockels started to claim that they had um, indigenous ancestry. And then also Anthony Zimmerhockel was said to have taught his students reverence for indigenous peoples. Because of this renewed discussion around the statue, Mayor Tim Cabot called together a group on Valentine's Day 2018. The group included city council members for and against the statue, members of the Ho-Chunk Nation, and members of the Zimmerhoffel family. The purpose of, this, of the group was to discuss possibly having the statue taken down, hopefully with the consent of the, the artist's family. Calling a group like this to speak together uh, was important in a couple of different ways. First of all, discussing it rather than debating it meant that you didn't have two sides of, of the story um, arguing against each other instead of as a discussion. And then secondly, uh, it kept the, the question out of the press, which was a problem in the 2000s debate and really made it go the way that it did. The group remained unofficial. The mayor's goal was to have this issue um, resolved peacefully and quietly. And the group uh, concluded on July the 24th, 2018, to move the statue onto private land at a cost of $50,000. This solution satisfied uh, all of the interested parties, including the Zimmerhoffel family, who were the ones that agreed that, they could, that this could be the result, um, and then those on both sides of the debate. This third groundswell movement was different from the earlier two movements in a couple of different ways. First, the Ho-Chunk and their supporters uh, brought the issue to the forefront themselves through the platform of Hear Hear and the student created video. So in that way, they were able to control the narrative. Open debate about the statue was held on Ho-Chunk pro property and was sanctioned by two city committees. So again, it shored up uh, by, by uh, reasonably powerful departments in the city. 
this sets up a different power dynamic uh, compared to the second groundswell movement, um, leaving the family of the artist and their supporters scrambling uh, to find a new narrative. And in fact, they didn't find a new narrative. They were just repeating the narrative that they had come up in the 2000 debate. So secondly, uh, this debate came at a good time in local politics where the mayor, whose name is Tim Cabot, was a progressive. So this created a policy window in which work like this can be done behind closed doors. He was very intelligent in the way that he set this up, given where we, we are and where we are coming from. Uh, so to have this debate, to have, to, not a debate, to have this discussion uh, and to have an end result with the movement of the statue uh, meant that, that you come out of a, a door and you announce that, the family's announcing that and so on, and, and uh, those in the city who really want it to stay have to side on the side of the family that, that will take it down. So this time, uh, the son-in-law of the artist says this, council members are going to change, mayors are going to change, ideas are going to change. We might have won this time around, but next time around, we may lose. This talk was about a public history project um, that became a small part of a movement to alter the meaning of a Native American statue in a municipal park. 60 years of controversy around the statue has meant that there have been many different arguments and moments of influence. Here, here intersected with these, these um, histories and actions within the last three years retelling a story of a protest that happened in the, two, in the year 2000. Uh, that's important because instead of it being lost in 20-year-old editorials, instead you can hear and hear and rehear Karacho Maniga and other people's stories about the statue and how they find it to be problematic. While this is a win in some ways, a stereotypical statue is being taken down after 60 years of debate, in many ways it's a small victory it will do little to affect the larger goal of respect and understanding of the history of indigenous peoples. While the pain of the statue will be removed, the entire tragedy of imperialism and white is right history remains. Until the powerful white population is able to understand and appreciate the position of the groups that they have oppressed, express their sympathy and regret, and consider reparations to be made, this story will not be over. Statues may come down, but it is in the hearts and the minds of those that would have them stay that are the real battlegrounds for change. Thank you very much.